Hello, welcome to this first discussion of The Fugitive Prince. This is the fourth book in the Wars of Light and Shadow series by Jani Watts. We are reading this book three chapters at a time, I believe, um, and we're discussing them <laughs> every two weeks. There is a lot going on in the first three chapters, so we might be here for a while today. Um, yeah, <laughs> I have <laughs> the usual squad with me, Chibi Po. Would you like to get us started off with introductions? Oh, of course. Uh, I am Chibi Po. <laughs> I hang out on the page chewing forums and uh, also put her around on you know Twitter. I'm still going to call it Twitter. I refuse you know, <laughs> to call it anything else. Um, but I did also. I'm also started puttering around on you know the non bird app, you know mm. uh, the blue sky one. So I got one for that. So uh, mm. uh, pick someone at random. Um, Robin, Robin, Robin. Yeah, you know, we'll pick Robin <laughs> next because he hasn't been here in about. Him. Just utter chaos going on. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Robin from Begins and Biscuits uh, YouTube channel. Small YouTube channel who has the same name. Oh my gosh! I can also be found on Twitter slash X and also Instagram as well. I cannot believe we're on book four. That seems mm. ridiculous. So yeah, quite excited because yeah, he said so much happened in his first chapters. Um, I'm gonna like sorry, Chris and Amy skipped. I'm handing off to Jared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Jared, the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel, and um, I also hang out in the Page Chewing Foreman's, where I do a blog there as well for Creative Crossroads, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, this this book is a lot of fun. The yeah. bang to start off with, Chris. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Jared. That's very nice of you to be here. Before my name is Chris Mullen, sometimes YouTuber, sometimes person that appears in other people's channels and talks about books. And uh, yeah, I can't believe one that it's book four and two that there's so many books to go. Like, I don't think my brain can cope with the amount of information it has to ingest on like a even on a bi weekly basis. This is ridiculous. It is. You would think three chapters is easy. That's what I thought. And, you know, like even with the reduced font size, it's 130 pages. What? <laughs> how How long could it possibly take to read? I was spending, I don't know, no joke, three to four minutes on each page. And yeah, and highlighting every other paragraph. And yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. It's uh. Uh, it, it's it's funny because I'm like you get we had so much happen in the past two books and you're like how can she keep it going mm. like this and uh, and she does it's just it's incredible that she's still giving us a bunch of stuff happening and and a bunch of information too at the same yeah. time and and all in that extremely exquisite descriptive yeah. prose yeah. at the same time and uh it's really uh it's really beautiful thing to read i had i had some sorry go ahead robin no 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 i was just gonna say i fully back up jared i just it feels really weird because it's like this is gonna sound like a really stupid explanation but it's like a french plat where you start with a tiny plat and then she's like weaving other bits into the story as you're going along and like continuing it down and adding more in and adding more in and it's just like it's so beautiful to read and, and like take it all and see it all coming in because you're right i just didn't know how that story was gonna last for this mm -hmm. amount of time but you can just see how she's just adding and adding and adding and adding and it's just working so well at the moment i'm just loving it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry Vasha. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say the prose felt like I mean of course we've been enjoying Johnny Wertz's writing uh for the last three books but did did this feel somehow amped up to you guys like I everything was so beautiful I had to like put think put my book down and just think about the scenery for a bit it felt like having a painting described to you or watching a painting happen as it unfolded there were so many beautiful descriptions here and uh yeah i had some really beautiful dreams over the <laughs> last week because, because i was reading this before i fell asleep <laughs> but wow, yeah nice. i thought i thought it was so beautiful all the descriptions were so beautiful maybe some of it was carry over from um our reading of the gallant because at the time we got a sense of just how beautiful this planet is and how fantastic the Paravians are and how amazing the Paravian 
portions of the planet are maybe some of it was carried over from there like i had the base feeling of beauty around this planet but the descriptions they were so so pretty everything felt so pretty <laughs> you know like the um the whole bit where she's on the horse you know early on you know going over to the farmhouse for the you know to help the the um the pregnant mom um mm -hmm. and just the description of it you know it's dark and snowy and you know and everything and you just you can just see her you know huddled on the horse with the boy you know yeah. who you know <clears throat> there to like you know night sky out and i was like this is this is really really really, mm. really well done yeah 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 the, the uh, director in me was like oh i want to film that scene that <laughs> yeah. was, you know it, it just it was so perfectly described that it was like i could definitely see that on on a on a film you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i was thinking of movies <laughs> as i was watching as, as i was reading this because there's like um there's the use of environment there's a storm brewing in the background when something uh difficult is being uh explained or uh yeah there's just like so much use of environment and uh other signals when things were happening in the scene so yeah it, i yeah I'm, I'm really excited to read the rest of the book <laughs> these books have this incredible quality because i read this all this week right this is just in the past week and you get to the end and you go back through and you're trying to think right what happened in the previous chapter so when i go to talk about sunday i'll kind of remember what what it was and like you said like the first chapter but i was like that was this book <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't like in Vasmark or something you know it, it, it has this quality as soon as you read something like it's put into the history of the world like immediately it mm. has like a, like a permanence in it and I, I like i don't know yeah. how yeah. you achieve that or how you even set about to do that but it, it is it happens every time we come to read another set of chapters, you're like, oh my god. Mm. Just yeah. <laughs> and, it, ago. <laughs> and to be posed, it, as beautiful as that scene was and how well it was described, wasn't it such a kick in the gut that Alara had to make that choice? You know, about this yeah. newborn baby. She had to choose like a prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, she'll she'll have you know, you know, choices to make later, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right, yeah. But to promise to realize the act of saving this child has, mm. you know, yeah, put a, you know, a, a great big, you know, mess in front of her hand <laughs> um, yeah. that she's going to have to deal with sometime. Yeah, which includes, and boy, is she going to? Yeah, which includes the fate of the world. Basically, that's what they're saying to her. Yep, and. <laughs> It's just like, oh, just a small burden on my shoulders. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was such a great opening to the book, though, because it was kind of like you, you, it wasn't with either of the brothers. So it was like this little mm. cutout. It was mm. this, almost an aside to the main story of like, this is also happening over here with that gorgeous description and everything else and this big like prophecy. And then it just like, and then you're back to the main story and you're like, wait, what? Oh my God, what happened? What? <laughs> so I thought it was a brilliant opener to the book. It was really, really good. Was nobody else like super angry though at the uh, at the story at the options that she was given? Like she did a good thing. I'm yeah. sort of punished for it. You know, it's not it's not the way things are supposed to happen. Like you go out of your way, you kind of do the right thing, you be the better person, and then oh by the way, something you're gonna have to pick some something terrible in some which way that's retribution for your good act. Yeah, yeah. that's so unfair. <laughs> All the options she were present, she was presented with are horrible. <laughs> Each was worse than the other. <laughs> Not right. Oh, I know. Yeah. And I know just to like touch on the you know if you're feeling like it's all cinematic, you know, you know movie thing. Just that opening bit too, where she's you know, you know, um, waking up, you know, you know, because someone's beating on her door, and she's mm. in the middle of you know, her her you know dream slash nightmare. And you know, from you know, ref remembering stuff from you know when she was in Marior, and I'm just like, yeah, I, I would totally see this as just like the cinematic opening where you know she's just kind of laying there, tossing and turning, and it's flashing back and mm -hmm. forth, you know, dream wise between Ooh. you know her tossing and turning and you know the dream. Um, and I'm like, yeah, and then she wakes <laughs> up and she's just like, 
I hate everything. <laughs> She's like, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. It's cold. It's, you know, everything's damp. There's snow everywhere and nothing's dry. Oh, yeah. I did not want to put Someone's her clothes banging on. on my door in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> When she was describing like having to put her wet shoes back on, I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. that's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the poor horse having to deal with the dampness of her clothes, too. <laughs> but, yeah, it just all felt so real. That's the other thing. I don't, I can't remember the last time I read like this, where I just felt every time I stopped, it was like I was, I had to wrench myself out of what I was reading. And like, oh wait, well, I I thought I was I was supposed to be in a theater. <laughs> what am I doing here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that that was a good opening scene. What and else? It, and I know it'll be kind of morbid, but I I liked, you know, just the whole process of how she handled things after the birth was, you know, accomplished. And you know, she's just like, okay, I've got to clean, you know, out the child's lungs and. You know, you know, it was kind of gruesome, but I liked, you know, you know, you can tell that like Jenny researched how they would have done something like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. you know, she got the little, you know, um, yeah, glass tube and everything, and I'm like, okay, that's kind of gross, but I like, I, I love the attention to detail there. Yeah, yeah. But but it also led to some again gruesome but graphic and beautiful beautiful explanations of, of, of the kind of the illness and the sickness and the stuff the, the changing of the color of the liquid and stuff and all of that kind of stuff that I think yeah again is really visual for you as the reader to kind of tap yeah. onto and actually say right that she, this is the effect she's having and stuff and it, it's just again another great example of how you, you can write descriptive but if I was to write descriptive I would end up by the fourth book kind of going Right, let's use the metaphor about the grass and the wind, right? And, and just recycle that one again and again. And nothing ever feels recycled in this ever. Yeah. It always feels very fresh yeah. and very new, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, There's... like after she finishes it, where the um, the baby who you know hasn't you know taken any breath yet, and his skin's kind of you know grayish and whatnot. But as he starts yeah. breathing, and the color you know starts flushing back in because of oxygen and all, and I'm like, okay, this is this is really well done. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she uses birds, the play of light. Um, I guess the snow, everything, everything is beautifully described. Yeah. <laughs> See, <laughs> when when you're talking about something that has so much variance, and then I have to resort to the same three words <laughs> over yeah. and over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, it just makes it more incredible that what she's doing because. <laughs> This is, um, you know, th these books, there are thousands and thousands of words and, and she's not repeating herself and, you know, she's not, um, she's not, do she's not taking any shortcuts at all. And, uh, yeah. it shows, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else think that the fate of the kid will be tied to Arathons because he's probably going to look a lot like him? Uh, I mean, because of the prophecy, but also you know, the moment of shock she had when his father came into the house and oh, yeah. thought this was Arathon. Do you think the resemblance might be what brings that fate about? It's possible. Um, but, you know, we know that, yeah, it is tied to Arathon in some way because the the Sirius outright mentions it. <clears throat> you know, that um, because I've got it marked here. What's it say? Uh should he die on salt water, the one ye love, you know, uh, most falls beside him. Or should he die landbound and cross steel and smoke, the same one ye cherish survives, but betrayed. Uh, and then, yet should this day's this child's days extend to old age? Um, oh wait, oh first, yeah. Should he die in fire? None suffers but he. Forgot about that one. Um, you know, yet should this, you know. Child's days extend to old age. First to five kingdoms, and the whole world will plunge into darkness, never to see sunlight or redemption. <laughs> You're burdened to choose in the hour of trial, uh, Farrah Donnelly, and this you know child's you know, to give the natural death or the sacrifice. Fun choices. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, a question I have: Where is Alara in in the world at this point? Um, is, is she in Aretura? 
um, is that the name of the place? I did wonder what that was. I have no because, idea because it opens with her just waking up in the hut. I'm not sure how much yeah. discussion or or, or um, the description you get of where she is actually in the world or how yeah. she got there. <laughs> he, the the last line of the prophecy says, "Let his training be for the sword, for his path takes him far from Aridra." I sort of assume that's the name of the place, but I don't know where Aridra, yeah. on the okay. map that is. I can look it up later. I was just kind of curious mm -hmm. uh, where yeah. she's at compared to, you know, compared to where Lysay is at and Arathon's at and all that stuff. Yeah. It's grass plains in southwest Rathane, apparently, according to this book. Yeah, like, uh, da -da -da. You know, it's hard to see on the map in the book because of mm -hmm. the yeah. <laughs> being a split there, but you can kind of see the name, like, in the basically middle of the. Mm. middle of the two pages so it's like it's somewhere in there yeah um, oh yeah i see it okay nothing else is decipherable on the map but i see it yeah. and, uh, <laughs> it's so funny because when i was a much younger reader uh i would have nearly had the map with another finger when i was reading the whole time nearly like putting pins for all yeah. the characters in, in in the place i don't do that oh, at there it all is. anymore yeah <laughs> well, i have like <laughs> I got the website open right now. That's why I'm right, looking at the Yeah, it's like if I need that, I go to the because you can zoom in and everything. It's yeah. really, really yeah. handy. So, what do you, uh, what did you used to do with the information, Chris, of who's on the map and where? Because I don't think I ever read with the map open. So, I was curious what people who constantly look at the map uh, do with it. I, it would be part of starting any chapter or any part of the story to kind of go right. We're jumping back to this character, and this is where they are, and yeah. flicking back to the map all the time and saying, right, in relation to other people around the place, I always had to know where people are. And I, I, mm. I don't know whether, I don't know where that went, if you know what I mean. Like, the, mm. it definitely doesn't bother me at all anymore. Like, I'm just kind of like a rough geographic region of whether people are close to each other, each other yeah. or not is, is enough. Mm. And in this yeah. case, like, Arthur's kind of going, he's going away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's nowhere near here. Even though, I mean, she had me for a second there. I thought, oh, didn't Arathon have other plans? But yeah, sure, why not? Maybe he happened here by chance. So like for three seconds, I was like, wait, that's Arathon. But then, no, yeah. it was. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> black, black hair, green yeah. eyes. Isn't... Sorry, too. Oh. I was say there, there's there's one coming up you know um and i i just you know when i'm reading it i just have to have the map open because i'm just following where the character is going because you know it's a it's a it's a crazy you know wild 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 ride and i'm like okay i'm just following on the map as he goes <laughs> yeah i like to use the maps for like traveling especially mm. you know just to keep track of where they are and stuff it helps yeah. me visualize it. Yeah. Makes sense. <clears throat> Makes sense. Um, all right. What do we got next? Oh, yeah. Well, next, um, we had uh, Lysaia was playing some politics next, right? Yes. yes. The um, uh, the ambassador from Havish returning the, oh, the stolen gold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then we had that arrow come into the meeting. Is that? That's right. That's when well, happened, right? I, I I like to, you know with the you know um, the ambassador you know has been forewarned that you know Isaiah will you know do his utmost to you know turn your opinion but you must not under any circumstances you know false way or bring you know Havish's involvement in and right Isaiah's just like anything that the guy says is you know Isaiah's mm -hmm. just like bam 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 just like clockwork I've got to got to disparage Arathon and you know his you know everything that he did and yeah yes. can I ask a question because I might be being a bit slow here um but where does the Havish empire or city or wherever link back to in the previous ones have we met that bit have I, I've just lost that connection completely uh well we we met King Eldir at the beginning of ships because uh, that was where Dakar got himself knifed and got sent off to uh, help Aerith. And okay, then okay. they handled the <clears throat> facilitation of the ransom uh, for you know, Lady Talith in the last book. Perfect. Okay, thank right. you. But they want to, yeah, they want to keep <laughs> their autonomy, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, 
I love that line in here that says um, the price of their protection from the spinner of darkness might come at the cost of their coveted autonomy. Mm. And that's um, what you were saying about them telling the, uh, telling the ambassador, you know, that, uh, you know, be very careful with this guy. I thought that was a great, uh, a great mm. line. It was a great, and it was great how Lysaia was trying to play up those politics even when like the arrow came in, he tried to turn that around yeah. and tried to use it against, you know, for his own purposes against the people that were there at the table and stuff like that. He's obviously yeah. so clever though, because even with the ambassador, like the ambassador was just trying to leave. He's like, I'm just not going to get involved in the discussions, blah, blah, blah. And let's say even makes it so that he gets caught up in that meeting that he doesn't want to be involved in is trying to leave from. And it, it makes it seem like an accident, but it's obviously all orchestrated timing wise and, and everything else. So he's just um, very good at what he does, unfortunately. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the arrow, the arrow scene with the, um, uh, I can't remember the, the the title of the dude, but um, but yeah, that was that was done very very well. I was very nervous for that kid a long time. <laughs> for most of that chapter, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thought he was a goner. <laughs> One hundred percent. Yeah, I was like, oh no. <laughs> but what do you guys think about him not accepting the crown, uh, and how is that going to play into the? into the future uh, conflict here. It's just an evil ploy, obviously. <laughs> like the ambassador says it's it's theater. He's yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's not actually giving anything up. Yeah. He's yeah. just letting them think, you know, you know that they, you know, that he has and they're just going to you know, and then yep. by the time they realize that you know, it's like, oh, hey, we we actually are being ruled. You know, they're like, oh, well, okay. They'll have already, you know, everybody will be used to it. And then he's just like, yeah, that's right. I, I kind of feel like the point is going to be that everyone's going to be begging him to be king. And that's when he'll take it. Not just because you know, he needs to have it or anything else. They'll be like, oh, you must be king because of this, this, and this. And he'll be like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. That kind but, of thing instead. But it also plays into this this growing theme it's always been there but it's definitely grown that that the uh, Lysair needs to feel adulation he revels in the adulation he needs to feel that he is important and all of that kind of stuff and like this this chapter starts starts a cycle for me where, where i was trying really hard to like Lysair at the start of the book like i was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt but he's still sure. douchebag like uh yeah that was really trying to put yeah <laughs> we've got a new book we've got a shiny cover there's no creases in it nobody's broken any spines yet <laughs> <laughs> where um everybody gets a, a fresh start and he's just like proper douchebag. He's, 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 uh, yeah. And, I, I well, you know, it's it's like it is a new arc, but I like that you know it doesn't forget what happened before. Yeah. yeah. And we have <clears throat> oh no, you know, just like you can see the impact of what Vast Marks had done to Lysaire, mm -hmm. you know, where um yeah. back in ships and you know Warhost he had been emphatic that no man stands as you know um and serves in avenor as slave as a slave oh yeah. yeah he turned around and you know killed them but now he's just like yeah okay you know what I'm a just, hypocrite yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, they, no, no, they're absolutely. Slave now let him do you know and it's all Arthur's fault yeah he's yeah. he's like the absolute like uh fake news that he that he believes oh yeah and that he and the lies he throws out as truth it's it's so brazen and yet it you know th these people are still falling under his spell and uh yeah it's, you know it's and it's funny because he has he has um there's a part later on i think it's in chapter two or three where he has questions for the sorcerers and they're questions that we had too while we were reading this book, you sure. know. And so, it's not just uh, you know these the stuff he's that he believes that he's pushing and the lies that he's pushing. It's it's not just coming out of nowhere. They they're questions. They're legitimate questions. But he's twisting them for his political advantage, obviously. 
But, but do you, oh, go, Chris. Go. I was going to say, but even Seth Fear says that you know he's saying a lot of stuff, and he, he's not necessarily wrong. I think he admits to that kind of right towards the very end of saying like he is, like you say, Jared. He's very twisted in what way he thinks, but it doesn't dismiss that his concerns or his questions aren't without without value and without without merit. Mm -hmm. You know, but he's just coming from that face of being an asshole at the same time so it's very hard to give them as much credence as probably they would be if they came from marathon yeah. <laughs> well, and it also said... runs into you know since we oh sorry Robin, you go ahead no you... no, no it's good, it's good. Uh, but it runs into um and we and we get you know more of that here with you know uh, you know the in, in during the um the hearing at Althane tower when we get to that but that the fellow what you know what the rules here are you know and everything he just thinks he can just toss them aside you know mm -hmm. for his own convenience and the fellowship like no there's very specific you know they don't elaborate on every reason why but there's very specific reasons why these rules are here mm -hmm. and I, I i it okay well you, you'll be explicitly told why um uh why they have to maintain crown rule and whatnot in the next book very early on so we're going to find out very soon um <laughs> relatively you know, <laughs> it's gonna say it's gonna be a while <laughs> well, off months, it'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're we're gonna gonna find you know uh that out and you know you know the but like i said he just feels like oh i can just you know, whatever these these rules make no sense to me, and he doesn't really even want to understand them. He's just like, you know, I think these are stupid, so I'm going to toss them aside for my mm -hmm. own convenience. And it's like, not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, sorry, go ahead, Robin. Oh my gosh, <laughs> just, <laughs> just one thing I want to say. That's it, and then we can move on. <laughs> ahead, I, I was just uh, just going to say it. Basically, my thoughts on this area is like I keep feeling like she's trying to bring us around like when you see her talking about how well I don't know now but like you see him talking to all his followers and all the page boys and all of the else and he's super lovely and he looks the part and he's doing all of this stuff but I still think he's an asshole and I'm like I don't know if that's in the beginning of this book she's framing the setup so that you think he's an asshole and maybe it becomes more redeemable or if actually i'm just like actually i don't like this dude because all this stuff happened and i'm not just mm -hmm. taking on board actually he's also a nice guy in some aspects because i just cannot stand him <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know see interesting that point because i think that's narratively why you need the scene with the scrying with truth to say actually you know to get into the mind of him is it just the curse just doing this because as a reader i think we all have that exact same thought and mm -hmm. that scene gets put in to say actually no it is not just the curse it is part of his his ego and all the other stuff he has a feeling of character and they sort of say the same thing about arthur to a certain point but arthur's coming from a a slightly different place of being the hunted uh mm -hmm. and being you know being excused for some of the things maybe that, that he's had to do but the, 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 that's very clearly set out um that it isn't just the curse yeah know, it's actually, that Chris, yeah it's actually um Traith that asked asked the question yeah uh he says uh i need to ask how much of lysaia's acts arise from death she death the years a cursed instigation and how much out of way with self-will and then uh seth seth veer answers him like let me show you the aura and there's a you know there's a whole page there that <laughs> describes oh, <yeah>. his uh <laughs> describes his oh. answer but um so that was and, and and that's been a question we've been asking all along as well so it was great it, it was just so cool that a lot of questions we were asking along the way actually got asked in these first three chapters sure. and uh and answered to some extent you know as much as uh i think as much as she that they could for the story being told but um i uh i really like that because it uh it just it makes the characters in here feel more real to know that they're asking the same questions we are you know <laughs> yeah yeah Not very much so yeah just uh I'll, I'll... Because you mentioned these parts, and I had it open right here. Um, uh, Lysaer had been cursed to kill his half brother, 
the tenets of royal inheritance uh, led him to endorse that violence with a just cause. But nestled inside his ardent need to protect society, an uneasy, uneasy conscience spun new threads of gnawing uncertainty. Delusion entered, you know, in a, magister a magisterial spark of arrogance fueled by outraged duty. Now, Elias Sayer clung to the vanity of his privileged royal upbringing, where the coil of self perception slapped, shaped the ideals of principle, obsession flowered, a hot, hazy spiral that courted through the aura like coils cast off. Uh, off a drop spool. Seth Fear shared the resonance of dismay through the link as Traith resolved his conclusion. Isaiah used his flaws to deafen his ears to harsh truth, a lordly, dark pride that brooked no humility uh, before the misguided masses, a caring, honorable sovereign's undoing uh, that measure of shame and stark horror. No other descendant of uh, Halduin had lived to lead an innocent people to slaughter. That burst some guilt, crushed thought and will, and gave rise to a desperate denial. Um, he, uh, Lysair refused outright to betray his Silicid bloodline. He would not beg mercy and assign himself blame for 37,000 useless deaths. A penchant for self-sacrifice fueled that court of victimized fury and reforged an unswerving, unswerving purpose. An assurance as cool as a strand of steel filigree Isaiah chose his next course. For the sake of those who died carrying his banner, he would forbear his born generosity of spirit and embark on a more grandiose uh, campaign. Arathon must become more than a criminal beyond pardon, but the instrument of evil incarnate. For the honor, for the sake of past losses and grief, the man who styled himself Prince of the Light would not break down and cry weakness. Yeah. Yep. Yes. There were also sort of overt clues to Lysers. Um, well, at least I read them as overt clues to uh, what's Lysers, what's mistreat. Like when we, everything about what he does, like his behavior with the page boy uh, that you mentioned, Robin, all of them, they they have a very performative aspect to it. Like it's not coming from within. It's He's putting on a show. And I think at some point they explicitly tell us that he's, He's putting on a show every time he appears in public, he has to have all his regalia, he has to behave Gosh. a certain way. And, you know, <clears throat> that doesn't stem from like caring for people. Like he's he's got an end goal of manipulating people into doing something that he wants. And the other thing is um, he talks that I highlighted this. There's something he says about beggars and bullion or like what that they'll wait for it or something and it just felt very condescending like yeah yeah like they, they, they'll be there to take my goal like he didn't think much of the people he was quote-unquote serving right so it's, it's just hard to be sympathetic towards him all of that none of that has anything to do with Arathon and yet he's um he seems to have seems to be pretty uncaring <laughs> towards uh, his people so like, yeah he's hard to like <laughs> even yeah. without knowing that uh, some of his behavior is mistreat others not yeah now I think even just the, the the art of putting on a show and manipulating people and not caring to the point of his wife I think we're skipping ahead yeah. a little bit now maybe we can skip back to the other side mm -hmm. but even that whole thing with um I've forgotten her name now but that just made me like oh my god god he's completely yeah. flipped with her like they were like so well, was he ever in love with her really but um but you know how he treated her yeah from the fact that she just backed up and said actually Arathon may not be what you think he is or you're kind of going mm. down this path I don't agree with just from that like the the that that whole scene with her and and him just absolutely kind of belittling her in front of all of those people yeah. and then how he treats her and then the little sneak peek you get at the end at the very end i was just mm. like oh my god you can just totally see that that exactly that like it basically puts forward that it's all just performative it, he really doesn't care about anything else as long as his end goal is kind of reached yeah and i thought that was another layer to that whole like craziness yeah yeah that 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 would seem to be so angry I was like, oh my god, what an absolute because a lot a lot of it it's it's funny because it's also a personal conversation for the two of them to have. They obviously haven't been having, but he it's also a lot to do with the public perception of her. You know, if she was to be with baby now, then it could be a 
said that it could be arathons or something spend it, and he's all about public perception not the fact that he wants an error or that you, you have a baby out of love or anything like not that's not even in the conversation and i know a lot of like royalty even though he's not royalty that is part of their their, their life but that it was just so horrible it was so cold and it was just so uncaring I think it was so good to go on and then I'm harking back to the other book, but the, because you get such an explanation of her feelings and thought processes from the, the previous things to know that that must have been just the fact that he's now just cut off cold turkey just must be such a like painful thing for her as well because you've seen it. So it's just it's just a beautiful, again, really well set up sh play and show of what he is, who he is as a person. Yeah. And I think the parallels between Talit and Lysar's mother, we saw one scene oh, yeah. where she was really upset with his father and she's like, nah, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm not doing what you want. Um, so the Fallon have compassion running through. These guys have justice, whatever form that takes. Mm -hmm. But it feels like Lysar's father wasn't a very good person too. And he didn't treat his wife very well either. Mm. So... I guess that's another clue. I read that also as another clue to Lyser's mm -hmm. character. Most of it is not mistreat <laughs> driven. Yeah, at this point, it's almost like he's using the mystery bit. And oh no, he's he's not aware of mystery, but he's kind of using that to, to be yeah. a bad person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, free reign to do what he wants, right? Uh, so on a slightly lighter note, did anyone else feel like uh, Lyser's hair is its own character? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. It's like blue and everything else. And now it's like white gold or something. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what tennis is. You get older. Your hair is supposed to get lighter. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> no idea. You know, he's, uh, I know he was doing it um, at the end of Vastmark. And I think he's, you know, um, when he makes that big show, he's kind of, you know, using his power to make himself glow you know yeah. when he walks around because he's mm -hmm. you know the prince of the light um mm. yeah and, it's got a halo yeah. and everything what yes. a douche <laughs> no uh, <laughs> although yes. if i could do it i probably would you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> i want to impress you know who, who doesn't want to impress and all everybody as you walk around exactly <laughs> have your own halo your own background music <laughs> <laughs> well, you're walking out this music. Maybe we should do that for introductions next week. But when we introduce ourselves, we'll play a song. Right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, I yeah, don't know how to make it. Work like he, <laughs> Sorry, go um, ahead. Arathon can do, you know, illusions and whatnot and, you know, shift colors and everything. So it stands to reason Lazio should be able to do the same. So he could just like not just a little halo. He could have just like rainbows, you know, arcing across the sky behind him. You know, you know, fancy, you know, you know, make little specks of light that look like rose petals falling down from the sky. You know, he do whatever he wants. Don't get to learn any ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, it's, she's done. She's done. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let <laughs> edit. I don't know, but the important thing about Talith and, and Lysir is actually it shows the strength of her character. Really, is that yeah. she can actually disassociate her relationship, her relationship with Lysir, to the, what is her truth yes. versus his truth. You know, and, and actually use that as a mirror for each other in terms of the relationship. And there's no doubt, like we as the reader, love Talith. I think I don't think there's anybody not totally wanting to see more of her, chapter on chapter upon chapter. Yeah, yeah. I think in the first, was it in the first book, um, or maybe early Ships of Mary or Steve had mentioned, um, uh, for Talit, it's, uh, I think, yeah, there was something to the effect that Lyser will always put uh, his hatred for Arathon above his love for her. Mm. And Steve was like, yeah, that doesn't sound like <laughs> she's going to have a very happy life. <laughs> Man, are we seeing the repercussions of that? Yeah. <laughs> very true. I'm, I am actually slightly worried for her giving the very end, the last, um, yeah. the last chapter, you know, the three sections of what it kind of put in there. So I'm a little bit worried of how it's going to go for her, but hopefully we'll see, we'll see more of that going forward. Mm -hmm. In a good way. Not that sounded really like foreboding. But... <laughs> <laughs> I see her tied up. Now, I, I, I am hopeful that she'll 
she'll find a way out of it and we'll cheer for her at the end of it like at least yeah uh i'm hoping that's where it'll go Ooh, i don't know no. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. Uh, f- f- you know, seven, eight more books, seven more books of a war here. Uh, mm. That's a, that's a uh, that's a that's a a tough hope. <laughs> that's true. So, if we, I I am expecting this to go on across five hundred years because that's what the prologue told us. Elira's already been given long life. I wonder, Talit, how long she last? Mm. And in- oh yeah, that's a good question. point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. One of the things I um I like that uh, Janie pointed out here um, was that, and this ties into how the book still connects to the the previous three books, the um, practice of uh, navigation mm. on the uh, on the sea, which yes. was something that they hadn't used for five hundred years in this part in this on this continent because of the because of the curse of the mystery it's because of uh everything was clouded over what have you and uh i like how that was pointed out in the uh in the first chapter here about um they uh it, it can't stay lost for much longer so that's mm. i'm, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how that's going to come into play in in future novels i think that's just a little hint that there's going to be a lot more to this uh to, to to navigating by starlight and and the in the effects of the curse being removed yeah. Um, yeah. and what that'll have on some of the characters in the countries no definitely i just but that's why I love. I, I'm so invested in this as a series because I love the fact that she that Jenny Wetz does this. Like I think she planted that like mm-hmm. in one of the previous yeah. books, and it was just a note point of like the fact that he was traveling and, and they couldn't go far from the shore, and then it got left. Then it gets picked up again here, and you're like, aha, uh-huh, okay, yeah. yeah. And it's just super nice to have that kind of series view of it. It just mm-hmm. it's it's really beautiful. It's really nice. Yeah, I loved it. Mm. Yeah. Makes it worth like I really want to get to the end to see how everything's picked up. But it, but it is that, and, and I've mentioned this before. But like sometimes when you're reading books, and you go chapter and chapter, you go right in that chapter that one thing happened. In this, in each one of these chapters, you have three big massive events that happen, and then you get three snippets that seem even bigger every time. You know, with what the promise. So you get like six pieces of massive information every <laughs> chapter, and it's like. That's why I think oh, sometimes I just go, I, I need to sleep. I, I'm <laughs> yeah. a bit tired. Um, I can't. I can't take any more of this today. I, I, if I start the next bit, that will be twelve. I can't. I can't do twelve. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you, that, you write it down first, and you oh, get, yeah, yeah, you get it out of your system, and then uh, <laughs> and you move on. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, what's everyone's thoughts on uh, Mirn? Oh. Oh, that's the um, the youngest uh, Sabridian brother. You know, yes, 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 yes. He's, he's the one that's kind of like a a, set, a spy, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I had a note on him somewhere. Here. <laughs> I think my initial thoughts, because obviously, again, in the last book, you you find out that they're going to generally kind of going to be a spy if you get me and I was a little worried that they were playing it too open in the political game with Lysair because and then you find out that actually yeah he definitely is fully working not just being a background supporter like fully working for it and I was like I'm a little worried that they're being too obvious from Mm. the discussions they were having in that political thing yeah, I was worried about that too, but also there is, I guess, another explanation for why, because he isn't of the town people, right? He is uh, technically a clansman, and he has to support them. Uh, and, and we've seen him do that, I think, in the previous books too, when they weren't really on Arathon's side. He, they had to obey clan law for certain things. So... Um, I figured that that might be the interpretation of the townsfolk too, that since he's fundamentally an outsider to the group, uh, he will uh, disagree with them on some things. It was also a very nice link to the previous book as well. Again, that idea that you're floating this idea of Sabriden, not not the Sabriden brothers being in league and spying, mm. yeah. not 
eight chapters into the book, but kind of straight away to kind of say, look, this is always a very fluid situation. And this is actually what it would look like on a moment to moment basis rather mm. than just kind of like a big reveal somewhere further than, than, than the line. Again, they're very carefully planned and, and scripted. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I also love that, like, yeah, this is the start of a new arc, uh, but every thread we've picked up, right, that we left off at the end of the last book, we've exactly. picked it up almost immediately. We weren't kept waiting. Like, if we were particularly invested in one thread over the other, we weren't, we're not going to have to wait until, like, nine chapters <laughs> to figure yes. out. Yeah, but there happens. also there also wasn't any redundancy as far as rehashing yeah. goes either. Yeah. You know, it was seamless, and uh, you, I feel like you could almost pick this up as a, its own novel and start reading it and still not be too lost, but mm -hmm. knowing that a bunch of history has gone on before it. Yeah, yeah. Chibi Bo, you started somewhere in, middle, in the middle, right? Was it, which uh, book was it again? I picked up, um, well, I was familiar with her, you know, I'd read some of her other stuff before that, but I found... Um, uh, Ships of Marior was the first Wars of Light and Shadow I read. Yeah. Um, I found it in a grocery store, and there, you know, they have the little mass market paperback section, and you know, I happened to see the cover there, and I was like, "Oh, I know that artist, you know, and I know that name," and so I immediately grabbed it, and I have, you know, uh, destroyed several, you know, paperbacks, you know, rereading and rereading this series. So, um, but yeah, I. I I read the ships first and and then Warhost and I might have gotten cursed, you know, picked up a copy of Curse at that point and, and then I got Warhost, but I, I read second book two first and I didn't have any problems. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like you know, in some ways I I mean I, I understand, you know, I feel like, yeah, start with ships first. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Wow. It will spoil things for you for curse, but yeah. At least to me, it just. But not a lot. I feel like there's a lot. Like the last parts of Curse of the Mystery were so beautiful, and none of that was really mentioned again or rehashed. Like the whole bit with Arathon going body to body and saying a Paravian prayer was it? That that whole chapter was so brilliantly done. Mm. I I read it again just for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm already you now. I'll start there, just yeah. and do the whole thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, do we have anything more on this chapter? We we're only at chapter one, folks, and we're forty-seven minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm well, pulling sector work tomorrow. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> we, well, we did, it's like, well, we get me Aaron. His his bit caps off the end of chapter one. Yeah, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. In uh, yeah, in, where he goes and you know sneaks off to. Let Mayan all know, you know, hey, you know, Lysayer's people are, you know, you know, that, you know, oh, oh, and, you know, nice, nice little nod in the hearing when the, you know, um, ambassador's there and, you know, everything with the arrow and all. Mm -hmm. um, the guy who was the, you know, carrying the testimony, um, he was the one that was, you know, complaining at the end during the scene at the Havens in Warhost. Mm. You know, where yeah. you had that it pointed out that one guy screaming, that's my, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's my brother. And, you know, that was on one of the ships or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Mm. So that was a nice little oh. mm. um, carryover. Yeah. It's like just one of those little, little bitty things like, you know, with the, well, he didn't get as much flushing out of Tharic, but you know, it's like here, here's this little guy, you know, who's who's you know complaining about what you're doing, you know, and yeah, he comes back later to you know for that, and I say it's like, oh, dark magic, blah blah blah. <laughs> but, um, Lysir doesn't truly believe that he, it was dark magic, does it? Like really, it, it, it's sort of, or maybe I did miss something on it, but it it feels like he doesn't, but almost. He, there's like a little part of him says it could be, you know what I mean, mm. and, and that's really what he's preying on because I, I still don't believe like this year's openly lying. If you know what mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't think he's he's totally in that state. Uh, and he, but it's even when the the, uh, the fellowship confront him and he, and he does start to sort of twist it and say, ah, but the, you're only 
you're not doing this both ways if you do this both ways and he sort of tries to play with the fellowship which i thought was very mm. brave of him which mm. ultimately well, backfires was... obviously for sure <laughs> yeah he was actually quite scared when the fellowship yeah. first took him yeah and uh but he finally came around and he um because he was came to his defense and he asked that question. He said, if your hand is revealed as the uh, root of our conflict and tell me why have you not acted, which was, of course, a question that we've had all along. Um, and then, uh, of course, as a Sander sets him straight on that uh, question there. But um, and he's also said that the fellowship has never been a force in a thera to take guiding charge of human destiny. Um, but the, uh, so that, you know, they give him an explanation, but he asked a legitimate question there, mm -hmm. um, after being For scared, sure. you know, <laughs> and it was another question he asked, he asked, uh, um, oh, by what right do you criticize my methods before you have broached your own failure? Uh, and I thought that was a very pertinent question for Lysaia to to ask those sorcerers you know well uh, it, it, it's something that we brought up before jared at the end of last book as well you know the fellows yeah. fellowship are very happy for them to tear each other apart and mm. not concerned about the world like that seems odd you know and, and again address that was the question put put to them at that stage and, and and i think it's sort of funny that the only thing that whips them into motion is this act of outlawing and having like almost martial law to say we can lock up anybody that we want for a limited reason? You know that that seems to be the breaking point for the yeah. fellowship. It seems odd. Well, the, it, and it's tied into their um, their charge uh, for this world. It has nothing to do with humans. It's and of yeah. course humans are very human centric on mm -hmm. this world, and they're wondering why you know. The because so, the sorcerers most likely they look human, so they they probably want to, uh, and they want uh, the humans think that that's what they can relate to them, but they're not there for humanity. Mm. And I and I was, thought it was interesting that I look at the uh, the year that she puts in here for the third age. That's right, yeah. And it's like almost it's over four thousand years. Five thousand. This, this age has been going on. It's yeah. the year forty-five or fifty-six. Yeah, five thousand over oh, five thousand, and that's a long time to keep humanity in kind of uh, the Middle Ages. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Without yeah. them expanding their technology uh, further, and so that's that's directly the sorcerer is doing, the fellowship's mm -hmm. doing, and. Uh, so I thought that's, that's those all those little things that are clues into into the bigger picture here. That uh, of course, you know, we're not seeing everything yet. It's just yeah. wonderful. I feel yeah. like Jared's uh, setting himself up to take his particular side that's against the, the sorcerers. <laughs> they, they're fighting with the townsmen. <laughs> <laughs> Running under Lysia's flag, we think. <laughs> Just legitimate <laughs> questions, that's all. <laughs> I knew it. There were definitely signs. This is definitely one of these ones where I make like a mixtape compilation of all the signs that led me to believe you were you know, <laughs> <laughs> Count Dooku for one of another for Star Wars reference. <laughs> Next time um, I'll come with a halo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a back, a back line. Yeah. <laughs> so for those keeping track, next time we're going to have introductory background music and halos. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i have a question again i don't know if i was being an idiot or if i missed something again what exactly did they do to lysa i know they took away protection okay or, but what um, does that or, or does it get explained later because at the moment i've kind of like just went with it and was like okay uh, maybe i'll find out but it, it well i mean some people you know obviously understand what it means you know within the, the story itself but um so mankind arrived, you know, first third age year one, um, and they um, 
with the fellowship serving as arbiters, you know, um, treated with the, the Peravians and were allowed to settle on Athera. Um, and um, Jenny's uh, may have gone into some of this with one of our other earlier reads. I don't remember uh, where I don't, I transcribed it for, her, you know, so we could get it into the, you know, wiki and whatnot, but I don't remember which one it was, you know, because I was listening to a bunch of them to put it all down. But um, they were specifically um, laid down, uh, and that's how the the um, the clans of the High Kings were formed. Is the um, uh, they specifically laid down at that time? You know what you know what the terms of you know humanity being able to settle here was, and uh, you had the the townsfolk, you know. Um, who you know largely lived in coastal areas um, because a lot of the land in inward was you know Peruvian territory and they couldn't you know as we saw in the gallant you can't just right. wander into that you know for with the Peruvians there um, within the towns the townsfolk could basically do whatever they want um, you know barring certain actions such as you can't have slaves you know and what and certain technologies you know outlawed. Um, and you know if they want to you know but when if they they break any of those rules or whatnot then the high kings would be the ones to address you know those specific issues and then if it had to get escalated the high kings would serve as you know intermediaries with the Peravians because not everybody can withstand Peravian presence um and also the fellowship would also so it'd be like townsfolk have their own rule um high king serves an intermediary you know in making sure the areas you know prescribed lands stay you know inviolate and whatnot and address you know th you know things if it escalates then the high kings you know relay to the fellowship and then it's addressed there um and then you know and then beyond that to the Peravians. Um, by casting him out, um, none of that, so that system any applies to him anymore. So if should the Peravians return, um, he's no longer under the auspices of the fellowship. They're intercede they can't intercede for him. He would, you know, have to deal directly with the Peravians. Um, and mm. in you know So it has no direct consequence at the moment it's only uh, if the Peruvians come back right did, uh, did he not lose his powers then because that's the way i read it uh no it, it wouldn't wouldn't do that to him it would just because the, those were inborn and you know made to you know persist from generation to generation basically genetically tied to him so they did allude to the fact that he couldn't use his power straight away afterwards. Straight after I, I felt yeah. like it was just a um, like visceral reaction to yeah, yeah. what had occurred rather than him losing his powers, and that's how I read it anyway. It, it could be me projecting, hoping that's what happened to Sarah rather than... <laughs> <laughs> Very possible. Yeah. Speaking of Lysair's head, uh, there was <laughs> one... <laughs> <laughs> one uh, bit during his time in the uh, when the fellowship had him his hair was no longer shining and it was fallow and uh, I don't know there were some words used that made me think it was no longer shining so has he kept his hair shining with his gift of light the whole time <laughs> probably wouldn't surprise me make absolutely yeah. it's part of his whole ethos isn't it <laughs> He'll just go back to straw when he's not his power. <laughs> no conditioner. He doesn't use conditioner, and then, then you know when he's using his magic, and then it's fine. I just have this great image on, on Varsha's wall in front of her. She has a timeline of Lysir's hair alongside. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Quality of her, strength was... of her, color of her. You know. <laughs> I was actually thinking of doing a bright thread episode on Lysir's hair. <laughs> that would be a very good idea. <laughs> the, word, the word you want to use in that episode is Tambra, right? A Hershey of a Tambra. Okay, so <laughs> chapter two, prophecy number two. <laughs> oh, oh yes, I, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jared. <laughs> uh, Jared has dreams, right? 
Yes. Yes. Uh, yep. Yes. <laughs> I I know we met his wife for like two pages, but I love her already. Ah. I <laughs> I love her so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that was another terrifying prophecy. Does anyone else feel like knowing how the other books go? The thing that Jared dreamed about would happen in the middle of the book and not the end of the book. <laughs> so, so my, I think I've said this before. Every time we get one of these prophecies, you think this is going to happen in like book eight. Yeah, this is going to happen like book seven, and just about every time it happens in the middle of the book, and you're like, oh god, I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah, this time you haven't got absolutely. me. Absolutely, no, absolutely. I believe they say you just think it's going to be a far off thing we're going to build in, and then you're like, bam, you're right there. You're yeah. Like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you're expecting a long, drawn out fantasy, and uh, it's not happening that way. It's just not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd think anything that would be a big event to build up to in most fantasy series mm-hmm. is a middle of the book event in this one. Like, <laughs> how, how do you do, do that? How do you build important thing after important thing? And we're seeing some of the seeds laid here, right? Like what we find out with uh, trade and having a part of his consciousness um uh what trapped with the <laughs> rest of the mystery uh and and they really so this is interesting to me that they're not like yeah cool whatever like we're just not going to be able to heal trade now they're like no we have more stakes added to the situation and we need to solve this problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah he's not going to be a sacrifice <laughs> but I, I, th- I think the book needs that if you know what I mean it, re- it can't just be that the mystery is just linked to the end of the world and, and the fates of both of our characters and that nobody else matters it mm. needed, I, I was again very glad to see the fact that yeah. somebody else had stakes in this other than mm. I see her mm. on, you know at yeah. the end of the world absolutely yeah, yeah. It, it links their causes together basically yeah, so it does. Mm-hmm. yeah. 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 <laughs> so he's now Ar- Arathon has this um this writ against him, this writ of arraignment. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- where's that from? It's, it says I have something up here about Avenor, but I'm not sure what who that is. Uh, Avenor is uh, Lazare's capital. You know, so oh, okay, all right, right, right. Where he uses him a dark sorcery. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so he's got this this uh, writ of arraignment, and um, and so. Jarrett's quite um, worried about that. Actually, he's. They had this conversation over this, uh, over this, you know, arrest, and they actually had this this argument. Like, is it true and all this stuff? Because um, because he doesn't actually see him that often, right? Because mm-hmm. they're That's separated true. a lot, and uh, so he doesn't know the full story of the whole war host in, in the Vasmok and all that stuff, and. Um, I I thought that was just excellent uh, repurposing a point of view on how the characters just don't, you know, we know a lot, but the characters don't. don't. And that was an excellent way of showing that. And I, I loved how she did that. And uh, and she tied it into his um, his dreams mm. and his worry for Arathon. <clears throat> over the fact that he's seeing him you know get hanged or whatever whatever it's going to be and he's tying it closely into this this uh um this uh writ of arraignment or what is yeah. it like it's like a warrant arrest warrant <laughs> and um <laughs> uh so i th- thought that was beautifully done as well mm-hmm. um but we, we mentioned <clears throat> earlier about lysaia putting on a show but I also think Arathon does his part to put on a show as well when he kind of comes around a corner and says, I heard that. I'm surprised, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you wonder uh, how much <laughs> how much of that was done on purpose on Arathon's part uh, and also how much of the show he put on to drive Jarrett away basically Mm -hmm. you know it's to save his you know you know you know he wants to keep him safe he's doing it for that purpose but um you know so there's there's a lot of there's a theme of showmanship going on here that's Mm. that's what i'm saying yeah yeah 
Arathon's very dramatic. Like yeah. he's full of drama, full yeah. of drama. I think is the person. But I think you said um, Varsha earlier. You saw. You said that with Nasir, you really saw saw the impact of the the previous book and the events that happened in there. But obviously, again, you really saw them about how much Arathon is suffering from the atrocities yeah. and what happened in that. And it's really and this. This is a really big opening, showing how much it's really affected him and yeah. his like confidence and and his generalness with people so yeah it's, it's drama and also trauma i think <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, on my review for the book um i started it off with like you know because you know we know erithan won at the end of the book you know i mean for as much as you want to call it a victory i mean he defeated eliza you know we can unequivocally say that but i was like you know i was like in victory despair mm. Mm you know, for Arathon, and then, like, for Lasayer, it's, like, in defeat pride, because, you know, Lasayer's pride has definitely, you know, gotten broken, and he's just, you know, pricked there, and he's just, like, I mean, when the Sabridian brothers actually, you know, kind of predicted it at the end of Warhost, when they was talking, when Arathon was talking to them, he's like, you didn't just crush his Warhost here, you, you, you hurt his pride, and he's not gonna let that go. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I think, Jared, to your point about performance between the two, I think, yeah, that's a great point. But also, it feels like there's so much we can, if we just sit down and do a compare and contrast exercise between the two brothers, uh, Arathon's performance is because he cares. And mm -hmm. Lysa's performance is, it feels like it's because he doesn't. Like he's putting on a show to manipulate, and so is Arathon, but it's because he wants to look out for Jared. But with Lyser, how do I say this? He yeah. doesn't think much of the people he's manipulating, you know? Yeah, he's for his own goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. coming from a completely different place. Yeah. 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 And also, uh, the thing we were just talking about the impact of the, the war, the, the 35,000 deaths. Arathon's like completely internalized the fact of their deaths and is dealing with it uh, with that intense scene with Dakar, you know, keeping watch uh, overnight. That was, yeah. Anyway, and Lyser is just like shoving off all responsibilities like, nope, not my problem. <laughs> I'm going to pretend that that's someone else's fault. So, yeah, I love the <laughs> contrasting situations. They, they are similar, but so different, the two of them. Um, yeah. yeah, and and, and Arathon's doing it out of compassion for Jarrett. Yeah, but there's <laughs> still such a strong sense of tension the whole yeah. time you're reading it. And yeah. like I was tense. I'm gripping the pages like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But do you find again? Do you, back back to the how I said less earlier? Do you feel like sometimes with what he says and what he does to people? He is also being an absolute just us. Like he's being horrible to these people, but because he's doing it from a place of he's yeah. trying to be, he's trying to save them from something, or he's trying to make push them away for an actual reason. You're still always behind him. Like you, mm -hmm. you know yeah. why he's doing it, so you're way yeah. more forgiving about. It, even though you're like, oh, that was a bit, a bit much, but you, you don't. At least I don't think he's a bad yeah. person. It's just crazy. yeah. No, he has a more noble reason for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. In some ways, like when Jared rushes across the country to get find Arathon and finds Arathon and says, "You know, I've seen foreseen great problem," and Arathon's just like, "Oh shit, I'm in trouble. I'm in danger. Tell me something I don't know. Go away." You know, you kind of feel you feel for 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 Jared that he's I mean he's left behind his oh, wife yeah. and his family and everything that happened here to come across and Arathon's almost dismissive of him. Yeah, and and and, and he, we we know as the reader that he's doing it to protect them ultimately because obviously there's things that go in the back of that but just sort of worry for Jared because Jared's still like a very very young man 21 yeah. or something that's told at that time you know he's trying to do his best and he's linked to this lunatic essentially <laughs> in some ways that, that just hides in the shadows until he can make a dramatic entrance in his full emo garb that he has <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> that, would, that, would be, that would be an interesting thing in the film exactly who they would cast him and whether they would just give him a kind of uh, Robert Robert Pattinson, <laughs> 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 I want to, but but 
it's only because we have sympathy but that them is sort of forgiven for all of that well you know he's not exactly the best of people there either you know he's not he doesn't deal with problems head on he doesn't talk to people he doesn't do that he, he does manipulate people so some of the things that are levied at him are sort of are sort of right yeah oh yeah yeah Oh, I'm not team nice here like Jared, but you know. Hey, <laughs> I was going to say, are we having another person? Uh, no, here? no, definitely not. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Jared and Chris declaring themselves for Chris. <laughs> Sorry, no, like <laughs> I'm all on Chris's side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then we got. Um, was it Mor Moriel? Moriel, yeah. Oh yeah. yes. And uh, it's funny that they're trying to use the uh, they're trying to work some magic, and they they fail. And of yeah. course they're, they're blaming the fellowship for this, and uh, they're they're crying their lack of autonomy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How arrogant was the magic they were trying to? Uh, what oh, yeah, you just absolutely. close a vent like you think it has no consequences whatsoever excuse me have you studied some geography <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah that was uh and then she's being so angry at the fellowship for not like did i guess in some ways like like said the condescension she has about the earth is like oh all those dead children are mean less to you than uh, than the earth you're trying to protect. Like it's some inanimate thing that has no consequences whatsoever if you destroy it. it didn't you just flee from somewhere <laughs> and seek protection here and you want to destroy this uh, over again? Like <laughs> what's going on there? It feels like complete mm -hmm. lack of insight. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really furious at Moriel the whole time I was reading that chapter, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard to sympathize with the Koreani cause outside of Alera at the moment. Like there yeah. is no doubt because it does feel like they just want the metal to be relevant rather than actually have a plan. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. Consider, you know, as we know, um, humanity arrived on, you know, Athera, which implies a spacefaring race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Koreani, you know, predate the arrival of on Athera. So the Koreani's perspective, you know, with again considering, you know, you know, different groups priorities, you know, like the fellowship are concerned about the planet and Paravians, um, and the Koreani, you know, of any of them, Moriel would be like, Yeah, humankind was a starfaring race. Um, and now they're just stuck here on this backwoods thing and we you know, we as a a group who had you know all kinds of influence have been crippled and you know can't do you know mm. you know so much of it's been restricted so for their perspective is like <clears throat> you know we're just stuck on this backwoods and i have all this information that i cannot use that would mm. you know make humanity ascend it and get them back out into the you know space again yeah, yeah and she she um she asked them she asked the sorcerers you know why haven't you well, basically why did you stop me from killing him and uh or why did you know the car jump in front of the arrow or what have you but uh and she says she tells them you know you have the power to, to stop this these people and of course they they dissemble and say you know we we don't um they're two grown men with free will and not string puppets their lives are not ours to use uh for expedience and then uh she yells at them saying that's a pitiful excuse and you act when you move to and how else did five royal lines come by their gifts in the first place and why should your wasteful apprentice have taken this arrow and uh the curb powers of the waste don't establish this point beyond doubt and then seth fair tells her that it's not us curbing the power it's the it's the uh the earth itself is your arbiter which yeah is a interesting thing because she's not going to accept that because we mm -hmm. see it in the first bit you know where she you know goes to you know she's just sitting there before she does the whole scrying with Lorinda and 
she remarks on how she refuses to absolutely believe that the planet has any kind of awareness whatsoever. It's just, it's just rock. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's no awareness here, you know, of any sort. She's like, I refuse to, to even consider that. It's, it's just my brain playing tricks on me. <laughs> Cause you know, again, she's like, yeah. just, and she assumes that they've got some kind of agenda that she doesn't know. And like, yeah. Well, obviously, Dakar did this, you know, at your instruction and not just doing it because he felt like, you know, it was a thing he had to do. Mm. Um, yeah. And she's asking, what's so special about these blasted unicorns, <laughs> basically? <laughs> yeah. um, so, so, so who, who, who wants to, to, to get, get a little bit of a mind blow here? Oh. Oh, I don't Always. Know. <laughs> so when they do their thing that, restores the hearing of you know her servant right yes right yep um and she erupts to screaming at them about how um you know they they stood the coriani stood you know, was older than the fellowship um or so she claims um and that they stood at the you know right hand of human governance blah 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 before and then she specifically mentions a name here and this is this this is one if you Remember, Kincaid. you might remember this. Callum Kincaid, you know, sold out his mm -hmm. great weapon. Um, does anyone remember a reference from an earlier book about that? Oh, sort of. No? Was it when the when Asandir was telling uh, the Bridian brothers the story of how they came? Well, yeah, that how... ties into it, but specifically. Um, Curse of the Mist Wraith. There's a little, 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 little tidbit in the scene after Lysayer curses Arathon, where they're, um, you know, you know, pulling the wraith out of, you know, Lysayer and Asandir, I believe it is, you know, one of them asks a question, and Asandir is like, "Let Cal work, and you know, he'll tell you," referring to Sethvir. Oh. So Callum can go to Sethwick? Wait a second, what? Yes. Do you, actually, do you know, there were several places in this book, or maybe at the end of the last book, where they're referring to what they may have been when they were younger. Yeah. And there's a, there's a couple of hints and tidbits that they put in when they're talking about, like, hands and about, like, what the new strength you could have seen previously, where she's she's just jumping. The, I'm, I'm so annoyed because I'm going to have to reread the entire series when I finish because of all these links. <laughs> well, and, and, and the scene in ships, um, Asandir, you know, talks about how they were summoned here by the Drakes, you know, plucked out, you know, in their, for out, out in their travels in the stars um, because they were masters of destruction without parallel. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. But here, here's the thing to consider: the fellowship arrived in third or second age, you know, early in the second age, like second age year one, I believe, marks the point where they they arrived on Athera, summoned by the you know plucked out by the Drakes, um, and that is something like twenty two thousand years prior to where we are now. Because the second age lasts something like second seventy thousand years. It's it's a long time. That was a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, the humanity arrived, you know, third age year one, which is like five thousand six hundred years or so ago, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But consider how long were were they really? Was humanity really just wandering around? Um, before them, you know, in space for you know aimlessly for seventeen thousand years, or is Moriel Moriel wrong about her statement? Well, both right and wrong. Wait, the Drakes, right. the Drakes can warp reality. And oh, uh, yeah, we need to talk about the time thing in just a sec. But I have a question: How did we get from? She, the Koryani enchantresses were uh, what advisors to the government, I suppose. But um, why why did we conclude that there were seventeen thousand years wandering in space? Why would 
maybe they were just advisors to whatever planet they still were in or um, or do we think that they had to leave the planet around the time when the fellowship also did well the the uh the conundrum here is we don't know precisely when um we know how long a second age is but we don't know when um and the humanity you know arrived on Ethera, right um you know escaping the end of you know civilization mm -hmm. right? um but we don't know uh how long prior to arriving on Ethera the end of civilization was mm. so it's entirely possible that the uh, you know it wasn't that long prior to their arrival on Ethera that everything blew up you know that she's talking about you know sold out the great weapon and all that um so the seven may have you know like when she says they're older than that she's both right and wrong because it's not entirely possible the dragons plucked them not just out of space but out of time mm -hmm. yeah. my poor brain yeah my, my poor poor brain <laughs> <laughs> to, to, re to really help things along, can I just float the idea? There's a very forceful female adept that appears multiple chapters in this. Oh yeah, the the ads adept. The ads adept, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, she's not named or anything, but it feels like she has some relevance. Mm. Do we think she's the same one that Lyser met, or? And yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I believe so. Um, mm. she might actually be this exact same one, mm. um. yeah. And did Satvir and was it Trait discuss talking to the adept about the rates on what is that world's name, Makar? Like they could do something about it. I would, mm. yeah, I would imagine at adepts at creator of the universe so they should have scope outside of just Ethera but it it feels almost like the fellowship thinks that the adepts have powers they don't or have abilities that which begs the question could they have done something about the mystery and is it just a separation of responsibilities that made it the fellowship's responsibility um hmm. <laughs> yeah um. My head. Ow. <laughs> All the big questions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I thought some of the stuff that she said to both the Lysayer and to Seth Veer, um were very interesting when she was talking about uh you know, um he's all like, Oh, I'm gonna do this and blah blah blah. Uh what what does she say here? Um you know, the adept swept her feet relentless. Unstop your ears and listen, uh, a Zion of uh, Solicid. Persist on your present path and you shall gain your desires. As Lysayer's blue eyes widened, she pressed him. Oh yes, your half-brother shall walk in the shadow you create, but not before you stand blackened enough to raise despair of a force sufficient to break him. Um, and then later she is you know, talking to Sethbeer about how, where, if... Uh, um, um, where did she put where is that bit um, uh, whereas if uh, um, yeah while Ath's order becomes maligned by false truth and the uh, masses are fired to worship your prince of the light rather Aerith and Cephalon uh uh, Falen becomes the spirit in mortal danger of corruption. Um, honestly, that's a very terrifying thought. Hmm. Where Lysaia raising up his little holy war would eventually, you know, cause things to happen that would, you know, turn Lysaia or Arathon to become, you know, the very thing that, you know, mm -hmm. Lysaia painted him as. That's mm -hmm. that's that's a scary thought. Yeah. Well, there's confirmation right there. I guess let's say is right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jen. <laughs> that's it. 
You can't know. <laughs> oh, crap. No fellowship intercession for you. <laughs> By the way, um, the fact that the meeting with Lysair happened outside of time, uh, that's just thrown in there casually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the fellowship, I guess we knew they could manipulate aspects of time because they were able to scry the mistrait uh, before and after certain instances, I suppose. But yeah, this was interesting that they just held a meeting outside time. <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, I'm going to bring back to the point of like, sometimes it seems like they're not 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 powerful but they're kind of just normal and then mm. sometimes you're just like oh wait what a second they're, they're mm. doing this crazy ridiculous thing yeah. so it's quite interesting that she kind of grounds again like exactly that you're like oh yeah. okay that's 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 normal okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's just move on yeah 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 we're not yeah. gonna yeah. explain <laughs> no, yeah, just, i like that <laughs> just shows their ridiculous yeah. powerfulness isn't it so mm. yeah it's, yeah it's good yeah yeah did anybody I don't know if anyone saw this, but I know I brought this up in like whenever we met her first, but Althea, is that how you say her name? Did anyone foreshadowing from the, um, from this, when they were having that meeting, they're discussing afterwards when they're meeting the um, head lady. And then he says that she, he doesn't think that the next prime is going to take oh, yes. place. And then yeah. said the only other person he thought that would potentially do it would be, out there and I was just like oh mm. okay maybe is that is that mm. a thing for her maybe having to take that place yeah yeah oh. I think oh, yeah. yeah I think you mentioned it Robin that you thought that that might happen and yeah that that was interesting uh but what Moriel saw at the end of the last book was that she dies and then the line of Koryani matriarchs just dies along with them it's possible that Elera becomes the uh what matriarch prime, Kory Kory prime yeah koreani prime but like she'll maybe form maybe they work with the fellowship instead of against them maybe nice things will happen and that's the stuff i'm being hopeful about it's gonna be beautiful i love it <laughs> <laughs> and they lived happily ever after <laughs> although uh like uh Seth Via called that a frightening collusion. If that were oh happen. yeah yeah yeah, uh, so who knows? <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, we had the chapter where Morel brings Lorenda in to kind of force through her training, so so to speak. You know, to kind of don't you just you sit in the sideline and let me take over? And you know, Lorenda is sort of emboldened by the whole experience, but yet yeah. obviously, I would imagine to her downfall as as this this yeah. will come she will be proved not to be worthy or not be ready when the time comes yeah, yeah. there seems to be something lacking in her in her abilities or character that um that uh, she just doesn't seem quite ready for it yet it i thought it was interesting when they were in the stone um Lorenda first fears the power and then when she realizes what can be done with when she's overcome her fear she's like yeah i would like to manipulate that i would like to put that to use and that's scary someone who switches so quickly from fear to um yeah i want to i want to I want to absorb this power and put it to use like, why would you want someone like that to lead an order like that i feel like that tells us something about the order itself uh, the <laughs> craze for power is the person with the most craze for power is at the head of it. Well, not exactly. I'm sure there are other characteristics that define the next successor, but that they're okay with, like, this is not considered a flaw, right? For someone yeah. who needs to be perfect. Um, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I also really, uh, sorry, Robin, you were going to say? Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I was just going to say, I think that that backs up our whole kind of understanding of the order in general. And I, I fully agree. Like they, they go through this vigorous training. They've had 43 failures. Like the fact that exactly that, that that's kind of what they're forcing all of those people to be, I think shows that although, like you said, it's like, it's sad that they appear to be having overshadowed by the seven, they, all their power taken away. But you're like, but it doesn't sound like they're using that power for anything mm 
that would be good at mm. all it just seems like hungry power grabbing mm. do what we can sort of thing so I think mm. exactly that it's not a great reflection um on their order yeah yeah mm. and yeah I mean I, I I did feel sympathetic towards them in the last book when they when we were told that they used the waystone to uh, protect people from disease to ward off storms and basically stop yeah. a lot of hurt from happening but it I think in this book, it's become clear that the actions they took could have much more widespread consequences. Sure, you're saving a few lives here, but uh, you know maybe you're disbalancing the earth to the point where everything comes to an end a few centuries later or whatever. So the fellowship has a much more long-term view of everything. And yeah, I'm feeling more sympathetic towards the fellowship, right? Like earlier it was, you're not intervening, 35,000 people dead and you're doing nothing about it. but if you're looking at it on the time scale of the planet's existence on the on uh, the fate of races other than humanity and especially the Paravians whom we are told again casually that they were uh, wrought from the prime source itself. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I think I'm feeling much more sympathetic towards the fellowship in this book. Oh, also um, the Waystone when they were inside that it was basically crazy because it we it was being used to manipulate so many things it feels like so it reminded me uh the way we were uh the way stone was being described or the matrices inside was being described it reminded me of the end of curse of mystery when arathon um undoes something like he does something he shouldn't uh, by changing the uh, direction of arrows or something like whatever he does that destroys him it's not uh, in keeping with the major balance right like he's he performs a spell of unweaving or something like that I don't remember what it was called at the time but it was very destructive what he did and the way the way stone was being described it felt similar like it's not working with nature it's working against it and so and that's why it's being driven <laughs> mad and uh as like it's used to do more and more such negative or destructive um magic i guess does does anyone else feel that like that I, yeah yeah like the crystals you know retain you know the imprint of the things done with them and it's however old it is and has never been you know had it been cleansed or you know had any of that erased so and i think mentions there's like failed you know the spirits have failed um or imprints of you know failed as aspirants to the prime seat you know trapped inside it so or at the very least there's like their memories and they're all just imprints of their personality that are just trapped in there mm. yeah I did feel like rather than going to shout at the uh, the seven to kind of like change the, I'd be like, can you just clean this for me? That would yeah. be that'd be really helpful <laughs> if you could just clear this a little bit. Um, yeah, but also apparently they couldn't clear it because that was the only. There were very few things that had memories of uh, their knowledge from before they came to this planet, which I guess knowledge of technology is included in that. Uh, so if they cleaned it up they would lose that knowledge uh but maybe the sure. fellowship could have done something that would keep the knowledge but <laughs> destroy the madness <laughs> yeah well uh, part of it is they've they've got their own little collection that they brought with them but they can't use any that are you know mined on Ethera for you know um, mm. they're restricted from being able to use that so they don't have any place to put it yeah <laughs> You know, if they had a place to put it, she probably would have cleansed it a long time ago. But you know, then save the stuff that you know, <laughs> the stuff that she needs, and you know, and then it wouldn't be like, "Hey, look, this is an insane. Um, this is this crystal is insane, and it wants to kill me." <laughs> well, I'm sure if Lysaia and Arathon were to work together, they could certainly clean this stuff. <laughs> They were so busy fighting each other. <laughs> and things would fly, and the Kuriani and the fellowship would work together. Yeah, yeah. Why can't we all just get along here? It's great. <laughs> That's a good point. 
<laughs> so this is all in three chapters. Yes. And, uh, we yeah. only have we only have eleven more to go in here. It's Jesus, <laughs> Mary. <laughs> yeah. Also, since you 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 held up the older paperback edition, I just and I remember Varsha mentioned that earlier. I I I'm still baffled about the differences in like printed everything. Because, you know, Varsha said it, it was like 130 pages, but it's like 160 in that edition. It is, Look at yeah. The font. Three chapters. Yeah. Look at that font size. I, I really appreciate the difference in font size. It, again, gives it a freshness. I don't know. That's something weird to me about having a different font to read in. Yeah, yeah. actually, I did not like the font of the first three books. I, I, I need, this is too small, but the one in the first, Three books was too big. <laughs> Something in, <laughs> in in the middle would be perfect. I think Jared, your copy has the perfect size font. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really odd comparing the the older versions and the newer paperbacks. Uh, so just like it's so random. It's like one's larger than the other, and I'm like, why is this yeah. so much bigger than yeah. you know the other version? And mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I need my reading glasses, no matter what size it is. So. <laughs> yeah, I needed my glasses. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait till I see. I guess old Nuffily needs reading glasses. That, that is going to be a good part of the book as well. You know, yeah. with his lightning of his hair and his, you know, and, and a bad prostrate and you know, all these things will be. You know. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it could work as illusions of light to make things look. <laughs> you know, he doesn't need the glasses. <laughs> is that the texture removed? I don't know if I want to read the. 20 pages of life say uh, complaining about his old age but... well, you say that you say that you say that we right had, we, we, we had to read through the childbirth sequence and went, oh wasn't it written beautifully you know? <laughs> it will be yeah yeah <laughs> yeah was there anything else i feel like we've we've missed something but that's fine we've been going on for a while we'll get it next time <laughs> yeah um yeah there's a very good it. chance that we have missed something yeah. let's be honest uh, we've we been going for an hour and a half over a whole lot about um uh seth fear figuring out where trace and i think we mentioned it briefly but mm. you know where that's like oh wait trace the rest of whatever is damaged you know missing pieces of trace spirit may be pulled up under the um in the in the seals under rock foul, so yeah so we're like, hey, we could maybe put him back together again. Mm, but at this cost. <laughs> yeah. Dumpty, dumpty. yeah. That that did remind me of something else that I want to talk about. Um, the fellowship. They've mm. they've had their charter for what up coming up on thirty thousand years now. I loved in this chapter we got to see them vulnerable. The at adept felt sorry for them for how long they have been paying attention to detail. And this in the in the last few books, I didn't get the impression that their responsibilities were weighing on them. It felt like yeah, they're just carrying on. But we got to see many of them in vulnerable uh, situations or like looking vulnerable or feeling weary <laughs> of their charge and they're not looking to retire anytime soon they're trying to actually restore <laughs> to seven so that they can keep protecting the planet and yeah i just felt very deeply sympathetic <laughs> towards them again it is, that. it's like you consider <clears throat> it's like it's it's a staggering amount of time yeah like, you know, I know we, we get fantasy novels and they'll cover huge, you know, you know, swaths of times. And I don't think we really think about it, but yeah, frankly, just you, how do you, you don't even really, you can't even really process that. Yeah. When yeah. you know, your lifespan runs, you know, a hundred years if you're lucky. Yeah. That was in, um, this is, it's not really a spoiler for Malazan. There are some in Malazan, there are some races that live a very long time. And there's a conversation between a human with a human lifespan and one of the long lived races. And it, it was a conversation about how it feels to live so long, I think, or at least that came comes up in the conversation. And he says, uh, the immortal dude says, how do you feel in your old age? Now take that and drag it out for several thousand years. And that's how I feel. So this reminded me of that. Like, I think Seth, where there was one point where it said, uh, you, when he touches straight, uh, 
he says there's something about uh, feeling <laughs> his age through that uh, contact. So yeah, I've, I, I have since uh, come to conclude that this is the only way to write immortality, like show the weariness of the age, right? Uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, cities in flight is annoying to me, but we'll talk about that in the next discussion. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Yeah>. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And, I, so now I can just start go reading again. Yes. Yeah. It's been a long week for you, Jared. Yeah. So catch up if you're behind. Yeah. Yeah. We are going at the slow, relaxed pace of three chapters every two weeks, which didn't feel like much when we started but now yeah i think we'll try three again next week but if it still feels like a lot maybe we'll consider going down to two there's do you think yeah there's only about 110 pages in the next yeah. three so it should be it should be okay yeah, yeah no, no problem easier but it's yeah oh God, it, it's so much and it, yeah. it's like properly exciting yes <laughs> i want to talk about everything everything <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> Cool. Anything else that we should discuss before we wrap it up? Mm. All right. Uh, I will randomly pick now again. <laughs> then, Jared, do you want to do outros? <laughs> All right. Uh, you can find me on the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel, and um, you can also find me on Page Chewing if uh, that's uh, where you want to go check that out. And, um, Chibipo. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, as always, you know, Chibipo. I'm Chibipo on Twitter, Chibipo on page chewing, uh, Chibipo on um, Blue Sky, uh, and, you know, Chibipo on YouTube. But I don't have anything there. So, but I'll still answer if you like message me or anything. Can you message people on YouTube? I don't know. Um, no, you can go leave comments places. on the videos, but that's it. I kind of wish we could message people on YouTube. But... Uh, you used to be able to. Oh, really? They took it away. Yeah. Mm. I will pick Chris. Aww. Oh. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you'd be last again just for fun. <laughs> I feel like starting the theme tune now, but went, my mind's not blank. So I'll just say you can find me on my YouTube channel at Chris Moon. You can find me on Twitter, Seven O'clock Shadow. Although, to be honest, I think once Twitter goes, I'll go off that kind of form of social media. Um, or you can find me on the page tune forums. And I will pick. <laughs> I don't really have much of a choice because as far as just channeling, she's holding the chat, so she'll have to go last. So Robin, uh, I'd, I'd be delighted <laughs> if you'd go next. I feel, I feel so special. Thank you. No, uh, yeah, my name's Robin. Um, our YouTube channel, Bookends and Biscuits. Uh, find me on Twitter under the same name or on the Patreon forum, so we would like to discuss stuff. So yeah, and I shall hand over to Varsha for the closeout. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can find me, of course, on my channel, Reading by the Rainy Mountain. The About page has other ways to reach me. I hang out on the Patreon forum all the time, which uh, consider joining us there. If you'd like to read this book along with us, uh, join us here on these discussions or just chat with us on the forum about these books or anything else that you're reading at the moment. Uh, we'll see you guys again in two weeks uh, with discussion on the next three chapters. Bye. Pre-order the last uh, book. Yeah, pre-order, oh, yeah. pre-order, pre-order. Yeah. March it's up on Amazon now. <laughs> the cover is out, and it's beautiful and mm. a lovely yellow. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> um, mm. And it's up for pre-order on Barnes & Noble. Is it up on Amazon yet? I don't Amazon know. US is. is up now, yeah. Oh, excellent. Right. Yeah. And Amazon UK, and uh, there's a listing on Amazon Australia, but it's like... I don't know what's up with it because it also says in the description like release release date 2060. So oh, I don't know what's going on there. That's a hell of a week. Okay. Oh, I have to ask Jani about Australia because I had someone comment asking about how to order the book in Australia. But yeah, I'll, oh, I'll have to yes. remember to do that. But cool. Um, we'll see everyone in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.